Hey guys, Crazy Aaron here for another exciting episode of The Crazy Aaron Show, where we take a look at the fascinating parts of our vast and incredible world to discover the inspirations behind Thinking Putty. Let's get started. If you missed our last episode, well, you gotta go check it out in the video archive. So many fun adventures we've had together. We talked last time about the states of matter. Solid, liquid, gas. I hope that episode didn't leave you feeling too gassy. I know my daughters rolled their eyes at that joke. Did you? Well, we also learned about Newton's influence on science, how we classify these states of matter, and how he's influenced the very way we think, even when we're not talking about science, nature, or math. I wanted to do a little history today. We're in the state of Pennsylvania here at Crazy Aaron's, our offices, our putty factories right over that way. and. There's a special place in Pennsylvania, a place that's very central to the state, and I had an opportunity to visit. It's a town that's not really a town anymore, but it was. It's called Centralia. Centralia because it is almost in exactly the center of the state of Pennsylvania, and it was a mining town for most of the 20th century. In the middle of Pennsylvania, there's something called the Valley and Ridge Province. And that's a whole series of mountains that sort of travel up the state on about a 45 degree angle. When you look at it from space, you see these long stripes. Those are the mountains. And then dark spots between the stripes. Those are the valleys. These are part of the ancient Allegheny Mountains. You think, oh, Appalachian Mountains. Well, there's mountains that are even older, the Alleghenies, and they have been worn down over millions and millions of years. And in doing so, they revealed something from the Pennsylvanian period of our geologic history. Yes, it's named the Pennsylvanian period because those rocks were discovered in Pennsylvania. Another word for it is the Carboniferous period. Think about that word carbon, right? We know that's on the periodic table. Well, it was a time millions and millions of years ago when plants first learned how to grow, how to make lignin, how to grow with cellulose, how to give themselves structure on land so they could grow big, tall trees, big and strong. And once they evolved that ability, nothing knew how to eat a tree once it fell over and died, or leaves once they fell off of the tree. And literally what happened for millions of years was that stuff just piled up. I think it's a very interesting parallel to the problem we have today with plastic waste in our environment. Now, plastic waste is generated by people. It's not a natural occurrence, but it's very similar. Plants evolved a way to make a material and nothing on earth knew how to biodegrade it, how to consume it and bring it back into the environment. And it piled up literally miles thick, trees growing on tops of the fallen trees of their ancestors. And what it created for us today, hundreds of millions of years later, what? It created these mountains, mountains made almost entirely out of carbon, out of the remains of these plants. Those plants fell, they made those thick piles, and then more rocks came over top and more and more, and eventually it was compressed under incredible pressure and heat for millions of years, and those mountains were lifted up. Eventually those mountains wore away, revealing that carboniferous layer, the Pennsylvania anthracite coal, almost pure carbon. Fast forward to human times, also known as the Anthropocene era, and in the Anthropocene, we discovered that we could burn coal and release the energy trapped inside it. You think of rocks generally as something that doesn't burn, 
but rocks made from organic materials can burn because they contain carbon. Think about the sun back in those hundreds of millions of years ago, growing all those plants. And the plants absorb the sunlight and they use the energy from the sun to separate the carbon dioxide in the air and connect, release the oxygen and then take the carbon and use it to build their plant structures. And with nothing to decay it, all that carbon was stuck. But it's been put in a state where it can be burned to create carbon dioxide again and release energy. The same way you might burn some wood on a campfire. So we're sitting on this giant pile, millions of years of stored sunlight energy that is trapped in the coal. And people started to mine this coal in the mid, 18, mid, mid 19th century. And that really fueled our industrial revolution because now we had a source of energy that wasn't just human labor or animal labor, pulling the plow or spinning a wheel, doing it all by hand. We could burn it, we could make steam, we could make an engine, it could turn and it could make things happen. So with all of that happening, people started mining this coal. A town came to exist called Centralia and then something happened. Maybe back in the 1980s, some municipal workers were burning a pile of trash and they were just burning it on the ground because you would think the ground doesn't burn. It's made of dirt and stone and rocks, except these stones and rocks do burn because they were made of coal. It started a fire that crept its way into the cracks and seams in that coal. And an underground fire began that grew and grew until finally it reached over 400 acres inside in size, burning with gases, toxic gases like carbon monoxide. You can't smell it, you can't see it, but if you breathe it, it will kill you, coming up into people's basements, coming out of the seams in the road, little cracks everywhere. Well, eventually, Washington, D.C. had to get involved, and the federal government helped to clear out the town, compensate the homeowners, move them to adjacent towns, tear down the homes, I had a chance to visit long after this happened, but you can still see from these photos what it was like in Centralia, a town where the ground underneath it is actually on fire. Right, here we go. I've got here some carbon from, guess where? Centralia. I actually mined this myself. Now you can see that this was made from plants just being crushed down on each other again and again over millions of years. And these little white streaks, these are actually the stems of the different plants, different stalks. If you look at it on the edge, you can see it wants to cleave. It wants to break in a certain direction. Because this was deposited as a sediment, it wants to break, well, like sort of straight like this. So you can get in there and we're gonna crack this guy right open. All right, break off a bigger piece. Let's see what we've got here. Look at that. And oh, look what I found here. Look at that. You can see it. See the fern? See the different leaves? Preserved for hundreds of millions of years, revealed before your very eyes. Look at that. Wow. You know, Centralia isn't the only sort of town that burns or mountain that's on fire. In Australia, there's a mountain called the Burning Mountain, and it has been burning for almost 6,000 years. Whether humans started it or not, or it could have been lightning or something else, we don't know. But again, the same process is at play. Mountain basically made of carbon, made of coal, that can burn, started to burn when fire was applied to it. Now, the Fire in Centralia, it burns pretty hot, but it burns really deep, almost 1,400 
degrees Fahrenheit, and it will probably continue to burn for more than 100 years. There's another one in India, a whole series of fires in an area called Jharkhand. And that fire, again, it's not safe for people to live near there, and so it creates an uninhabited space that's very dangerous. You can't smell that carbon monoxide. You could just be walking along, walking along, and then... <coughs> One more place is in the Saarland in Germany, where there was a fire started around the year 1668, almost sort of around the time that Isaac Newton discovered his laws of gravitation, and that has been burning since then, so for almost, what, 300, more than 350 years. Crazy. You gotta be careful what you do with the environment because things can get out of control and it's very hard to put the genie back into the bottle. So I've got my firestorm thinking putty here. Let's take this out. Since we're talking about underground fires, I thought this would be a good thinking putty to demonstrate. If you've got a hypercolor, you can do this too. So go get your hypercolor and you just sort of flatten it out like this. Okay, and now I've got a couple things here. I'm going to start with a coin. This looks like I have some interesting coins here in the office. This is a coin from Israel, but it's nice and big. And I'm going to use uh, some hot water here to warm it up. You know, a good way to use hot water to make sure you really don't burn yourself. Use hot water that's just right out of the sink, as hot as it can get out of the sink. It may be hot, it might hurt, but it's designed, that hot water heater in your house, that it's not gonna scald you. It's not gonna be terrible. And let's see what happens. When I peel up this coin, what do we, oh, look at that. It changed color. We're gonna do it again. I, look at this coin I've got. This is a half penny. Half a penny. You think a penny doesn't isn't worth very much. Well, this Queen Elizabeth half penny from the United Kingdom is made of copper, which we know is a great conductor of heat. We're going to heat that up, and then we're going to shake off the water and put it down on our firestorm thinking putty. Two, three. Eh, it changed a little bit. Maybe I should warm it up a little more. You can kind of hold the end of the coin and warm it up until you just can't hold it anymore. And then you press it, one, two, three, peel it back, and look at that, it changed color. And if you like the look of Firestorm Thinking Putty, well, you can get it on our website, puttyworld.com, head over to Amazon, or even better, why don't you support a local specialty toy store in your town? Tell them you want some Firestorm Thinking Putty. I know they have all the best stuff ready and waiting for you. Now, I've got a letter here. This one came from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. That's in Canada. Anybody else been up to Moose Jaw? Well, sounds like the kind of place I'd like to go. We're gonna open this up here. Hello, Crazy Aaron. My name is Avery. Uh, my handle is Hippo Lover 8 and I am from Saskatchewan. Currently, I am in eighth grade, but I am doing schoolwork online, and I don't really like doing schoolwork from home because I love school. It's just not the same. I know there's a lot of kids watching right now who probably feel the same way as you. You thought that at home would be fantastic, but it got old after a couple days. You, can really, uh, you can't really ask questions if you need to talk to your teacher. I'm also missing my favorite sport, badminton, and I miss the end of basketball season. I'm sorry to hear that. I love your thinking putty. I have 11 in total, and I hope to get more. My favorite is Smiling Sloth. Oh, that's a good one. I like all the Christmas putties. They help me with my stress and anxiety, um, and you list some other putties that you like. Another thing I think you should know is that I love space. I really want to become an astronaut. I want to go to space and experience zero gravity. I even want to see the Earth from above, maybe walk on the moon or Mars. Well, that sounds awesome. And given that you're in eighth grade, the world is yours. If you work hard, if you do all the right things, you put your name in and you've got the ability, it can happen for you. Personally, I would love to experience zero gravity. I know I would get really, really seasick in my stomach because I don't do really well on boats, but it would be worth feeling 
terrible, terrible nausea just to try zero gravity, even for a few minutes. I think it would be super fun. I hope one day, even if there's, we're not astronauts, there's a way that normal people would be able to experience that. But for you, I think the astronaut path makes a lot of sense. You should probably send Elon Musk a letter because I know he's looking for people to go on that first mission to Mars. You have a few questions. Um, do you think you would start making putty when you're younger or did you have a different dream job? So when I was your age, I was 100% sure that my future was writing code, being in software, working with computers, I was 100% in. I spent all of my free time in front of my computer writing games and programs, and then I started taking classes. I did really well in all my computer classes. In fact, I probably did poorly in my other classes because I spent so much time on my computer classes. I never thought for a second that my life would take a different direction until, boop, the moment that thinking putty got into my hands, I knew that I was going somewhere different. And it wasn't just a plaything; it was the direction I wanted to take my life. Um, it's good of you to stop making putty and instead make hand sanitizer. The world is in a crisis and you are making a huge difference. My dad is a paramedic and he is at risk every day. I uh, thank you for that and uh, stay safe. I wish you all the best. Um, so you know what? I gotta tell you, I didn't realize how important that hand sanitizer would be to so many people until they started coming outside the putty factory here picking up and I went, wow, all these ambulances, all these police cars, fire trucks, nurses, doctors, utility workers, long-term care facilities like nursing homes and how grateful and happy they were. And it's nice to make someone happy when you give them something, but to realize how frustrated and scared they were that they couldn't get it until that moment when it became available from us and finally they could give us a call and we could hook them up. It's made me really happy. I know it motivates our whole team here at Crazy Irons. You know, it's not just me. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that make all of it a reality. And I thank them and I thank you for your letter. Uh, Avery, you asked about getting some of those inserts. I will send them along to you in my response. If you would like to get a letter from Crazy Aaron, well, you can. Write to Crazy Aaron, 700 East Main Street, Norristown, PA, 19401. I will write you back personally and maybe even include a special prize. Well, that's all we have time for today, so I'm gonna sign off. Stay safe out there. Keep squeezing that thinking putty. Bye-bye.